I'm uh, Ahmed Zuel. Uh, I, I am in the chair professor here at the California Institute of Technology in both chemistry and physics. To me, uh, light is life. It's as simple as that. As a matter of fact, I, I did give a lecture in India called uh, Light and Life. Uh, it is uh, on the human scale. Uh, light is the one that make us see uh, and understand and comprehend uh, the beauty of nature. Light also, from the point of view of knowledge, uh, is, is the one that removes the darkness that exists in the world today. All these wars and uh, what's going on around the world is actually because uh, we are not seeing well what's going on uh, with humanity. But when it comes to scientific uh, domains, um, photosynthesis is, is depending on light. So we can't have food uh, without light. Uh, we have to understand these processes. Uh, light is in essentially in every chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we need to use photocatal, what's called the catalysis, in order to convert substance A to substance B. Uh, this is done also through uh, using uh, light. Uh, so the, I wouldn't say it's even applications of light. I would say light is in the fabric of our life, and so it is. Uh, it is really important, and I think this was a, a very good decision by the UN and UNESCO to celebrate next year the Year of Light. Let me tell you, uh, because it relates to my own background, uh, the first calendar, uh, the first calendar t that humanity knows about, or humans know about, uh, was made in the land of Egypt. Uh, and in the year 4241 BC, that's a number, BC, uh, they were actually observing a star called Ceres, or Cyrus, sometimes you call it, and they noticed its disappearance and reappearance again uh, in 300 and uh, 65 days, defining now the solar or the, uh, so this is a light calendar in a way because you are observing actually what's happening to the light that's coming out. And they could uh, clearly define the first calendar that uh, we know they even uh, got the leap uh, year right because they noticed that it was a delay every four years, you see. So <clears throat> that's light. And that defines for us, for all civilizations. Of course, it got uh, more accurate with the Romans and and then. But it is clear that uh, light played a fundamental uh, role uh, in, in even defining time for humanity. Today, when I hear about the conflicts of religions with science and all of that stuff, uh, it's also in the same region where the three, uh, you know, with Judaism and uh, Christianity and Islam came in the same, in the same place. Uh, but yet in the same place, thousand years ago or about, uh, it was really the center of civilization uh, uh, as far as the development of science. Of course, there were places like the Alexandria Library, for example, 2000 years ago, which I always say in my lectures was Caltech of the world because, you know, people uh, from uh, all the big guns from Greece, uh, from Athens, used to go there in order to, uh, that's what happens with Caltech today. People come from all over the world to get the knowledge. It was like something, but that's 2,000 years ago. 1,000 years ago, <coughs> were interesting enough, because <coughs> Egypt 2,000 years uh, ago was about to go to Christians uh, uh, faith uh, but on the other hand 1000 years ago uh, it was uh, Muslim scholars 
so today when we hear about uh, uh, Islam and the, some of the problems that exist in the world, uh, actually during that time, uh, I give you an example of one scientist that's relevant to what we're talking about, and uh, his name is uh, Ilhazen in the West. It's called Ilhazen. Uh, in Arabic, it's called Hassan ibn al Haysim. Uh, ibn means the son of. Uh, it's like in, I think, in Hebrew, Ben. Uh, and so there is uh, this analogy. So uh, Ibn al Haysim developed the uh, uh, many things. He used to think that light, in order for me to see you, that I have rays of light coming from my eyes. It was al Hazin who pointed out that that's impossible. And that the reason we see, it's a reflection from objects and they come in a, in a straight line into our eyes. He also showed in a brilliant experiment what's called camera obscura. Uh, camera obscura uh, because he made a pinhole uh, in a dark uh, uh, box and he could see the images if you put an image of a candle for example here it comes out there inverted well that's a camera that's a whole concept of the camera but more importantly and that's what Newton Descartes and people like that built on is that that means that the light is going in a straight rays you see Otherwise, it will not invert as such. So that was a concept thousand years ago. It's extremely important, and uh, he estimated also the speed and so on. So that that part of the world has had peaks, shall we say, uh, of uh, development and progress uh, that was leading uh, the world. And there are many other names that I don't want to uh, take your time with uh, for that uh, region, but. Uh, like everything else, sometimes you get declines in these things. Um, and that's what happened over the last uh, several hundred years. Uh, there's many reasons for that uh, um, decline that also needs, uh, it's not appropriate for this uh, occasion. Uh, but we are trying very hard now in the last uh, 20 years or so to rebuild uh, the uh, knowledge base in this part of the world uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to see that we have established for example in in Cairo now a uh, whole new center of uh, excellence it's a city actually and uh, um, the government has kindly uh, named it after me and we are having uh, frontiers uh, research that's going on right now and there are other places in the Middle East now that building up also other centers of excellence. So our hope uh, is that this region will regain uh, some of its uh, glory or past glory. I do believe that uh, the soft power of science is critical. Uh, if the world is not going to be educated, uh, and enlightened about what's going on, we're going to be in deep trouble in this world. And therefore, I like to see that we in the United States invest a lot more uh, in a way of education, helping education, helping science, uh, producing more food, uh, helping more skills in these countries uh, to develop their own. I think that's much better than F-16 uh, and much cheaper. And uh, that's what I have written about, and I think it's good for the future of both, of the United States and the world uh, at large. We have to be careful. We have to really, really, in this country, worry about the issue of education and the investment in basic research. But in my view, globally, uh, we will be all better off if we increase or enhance education on the level of the world and uh, support uh, knowledge. Knowledge is the key. Uh, knowledge is light, you see, and, and that's very important. Technically, uh, we 
used for the, Nobel, the stuff that recognized by the Nobel were about the ability of using very fast lasers, uh, from two second lasers, uh, which are bursts of light uh, in a millions or billions of, of a second. But we recognize that the movement of individual atoms during the course of a chemical or a biological change, that these atoms move on the time scale of the femtosecond. So we developed uh, techniques, in a way, it's a camera, uh, that can take the, uh, record the time scale for the movement of uh, atoms when a substance go from form A to form B. And that uh, opened up uh, <clears throat> all kinds of studies uh, in terms of the dynamics of the chemical uh, bond or biological uh, uh, systems. But after the Nobel, I wanted to see the object itself. So there, before, before the Nobel, we had the time we can measure and we can study. But what is the structure of these objects? Uh, if you have a protein in you right now, uh, it does the movements of all of these thousands of atoms and it goes from one form into another. Uh, how can we see this form? So we developed <clears throat> what's now known and uh, Caltech has many patents on it and we have published our work uh, all over the place. Uh, what's called four-dimensional electron microscopy. It's imaging now. So we convert it from time measurements into imaging in the three dimensions of space and in the one dimension of time. And uh, this 4D visualization uh, allowed us with electrons, because with light uh, you can't resolve the structure. With light uh, the wavelength is uh, uh, because of the fraction, uh, you would be only able to reach certain limits. But with electron, which we generate, by the way, using light, uh, but with these electrons, you can see the atom. And you can see the structure, the whole structure. And so as a result of that, we now there are, there's a field now called four-dimensional imaging or four-dimensional electron uh, microscopy. And my group and many now other groups around the world are using these techniques in order to study materials, uh, biological system, chemical systems, and so on. To be honest with you, that uh, all my life I, has, I have been after the fundamentals and how can we cross a uh, new field. And, uh, but people, uh, for example, uh, out of this 4D electron uh, microscopy, uh, now a uh, FEI, a major company in, uh, in the world, uh, has uh, had an agreement with Caltech and now the manufacturing uh, these uh, new imaging microscopes and uh, uh, they are selling all over the world. So here is a whole new technology uh, that they the can do. But my thinking originally was all driven by curiosity. If you are passionate about something, you will enjoy it for the rest of your life and it will not be a job. Until today, my wife will tell me, the moment where I become a child and coming home so excited is when there is something truly exciting I'm doing in science. And so why? It's because all my life I have been passionate about this. So my message to the young people, search the landscape and find what you're really, truly passionate about. And for the rest of your life, you will be happy. It's not money in a big way. It's not influence and power. Uh, all of these things come and go. But I think if you are passionate about a profession, you'll be, um, you'll be happy.